So now we are happy to listen to Maximo Torero from FAO. The word is, the floor is yours, Maximo. Please no, go thank ahead. You. Thank you very much, Professor, and thank you to all for, for the invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Monsignor Marcelo. So let me, let me try to, to present how I am thinking and, and in the world I am involved. So, so to put in context, I am the chief economist of FAO. So my world is, is, is more focused on, on hunger and on, on poverty in rural areas. Uh, and that's our, our, major, our major concern and, and what I am looking at. So under that, that approach, uh, what we are observing today is a significant change in the way we operate. So normally we were looking at drivers like growing human pressure, ecosystem decline and, and climate change, which are essential drivers, uh, especially in, in the world of agriculture and, and food. But COVID-19 brings one element, which normally it was not so open, which is the surprise effect, the uncertainty effect, which for us is operating and making the sector, which is already running in significant challenges to operate under an options world where there is a significant level of uncertainty and we don't know what actions and what, what to do uh, under that uncertainty, because it's something that we cannot predict. Uh, and COVID-19 was a clear case in, in that sense. So under that new complexity, and even before COVID-19, what, what were the key, the key picture that we had uh, of the situation that we were living? We had a situation where we had 690 million people undernourished. We had a situation that undernourishment in the last four years had been increasing. It had moved up 10 million in the previous year and 16 million in the last uh, five years. We have 2 billion people that doesn't have access to regular uh, safe food. And we have 3 billion people that don't have access to healthy diets, which is what we need uh, to be able to achieve uh, our SDG2. So the situation was really, and all the malnutrition indicators were not on target and on path to achieve SDG2, uh, with the exception of breastfeeding, which was on path to the 2020 target, but not on path to a 2030 target. So the, the photograph before COVID-19 was already saying that something was not working well at all. Uh, and despite in the world, we have enough food for everybody. Uh, which is what, if we look at the numbers in terms of supply of food, we have enough food, although it's true that we don't have enough quality of food uh, to, be, to be able to satisfy everybody at the price they can afford. But in aggregate level, we had sufficient food. If I had to, to close the gap of calories, I can close the gap of calories, but I am not by far. Of course, my aim is to close the gap of good quality diets. Then it comes COVID-19 and what COVID-19 does for us is basically show us several things. First is that the undernourishment could increase up to 132 million, uh, between 83 to 132, depending on the, on the GDP growth. We are losing a decade on extreme poverty because extreme poverty could be now up to 115 million according to, to the bank. But not only that, there is a huge recession that we're going to face, which is the decline of the global GDP in minus 4.4, according to the last estimates of the IMF, bring us a huge potential problem of, of food access. So capacity of countries to be able to afford the food that they need uh, and to, of course, move out of poverty relative to the ceteris paribus situation, which was already not so good. So that, that creates a big problem. Now, on the positive side, what we have seen is that despite all these problems, food is still available. So you can go to your supermarkets and you have food. Uh, you can go anywhere and food is available, meaning that the production side sector has shown to be resilient to this, this uncertainty and, this, and these shocks. So something good is there in terms of how flexible it has been. Uh, and something good is there in terms of how the markets have been able to resolve certain problems. And the first problem that came up at the beginning of the COVID-19, because the logic was, the health issue and they close everything because of the health issue and they forgot about that people need to eat. Uh, and then later on, they start to be fixed, of course, in, in most of the countries. But, but what we observed there is that uh, the trade issues that immediately reacted, which was export restrictions, export bans, it was not as significant as before as, for example, during the 207, 208 food crisis. Uh, and the reason was because there was more information on availability of stocks and more information on how much food was available in the harvest of, of this year, which helped enormously to put some pressure on the countries that were putting export restrictions to lower them now. So we started with 20 countries putting export restrictions, today we're in zero. So that have come significantly the markets. But, but the, 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 the major concern to us uh, is still, okay, what we do now, no? and how we resolve the problem, which 
COVID-19 has just exacerbated the problem that already was there, but it's a problem that we want uh, to, to resolve now. Uh, and the major concern for us is not only poverty, it's not only hunger, but it's what it was mentioned before by, by Professor Stiglitz is, is the issue of inequalities and how much the current situation is going to exacerbate and is already exacerbating inequalities. And it's very simple to see. If you go to developed countries, you have unemployment insurance. Uh, and many of them are using that to cope with the unemployment rates. And if not, you have social security. If you go to developing economies, most of them are informal. So they don't have unemployment insurance and they don't have social security. So in a world of 60% of informal workers, what a position and a, a shock like COVID-19 will create is, is enormous. And still, I, I cannot foresee how these people are coping because essentially, if you go to my country, which is Peru, you have 60% of informality. How these people can handle a situation where you are locked down for close to two months, where they don't have any capacity to get any income and they don't have any government support. And if the government supports, what they will support is the traditional cash transfer programs. But the people being affected are different, are people which are not the same as they normally uh, are touched by, by, by the conditional or, or the non-conditional cash transfer programs. So this increase in inequalities, which happens within the countries, but it's also clearly happening between countries and exacerbating even more the differences because developed countries have the capacity to do significant uh, government programs to reactivate their economies. Developing countries don't have that capacity. And not only that, whatever happens in developed countries in terms of putting trillions of dollars to reactivate their economies have a consequence in what will happen also in developing economies. But if we abstract from that within the country, that exacerbation will even increase increase more. Uh, and, but, but again, uh, that, that's the situation we are facing. So what, what to do for us or what, how we can cope with this? So we, when we try to assess what are the key drivers behind of what we are observing, uh, we are observing four key drivers before even COVID-19. One is conflict, which in our case is extremely important. Most of the food, price, uh, food crisis countries are conflict countries. Second is climate is affecting everything we do in rural areas because we depend on, on the weather and the rainfall. Irrigation is not something common. Uh, most of it is rainfall. Third, we know that economic slowdowns and downturns, which is what we are going to face because of COVID-19, has a significant effect on the rates of undernourishment. And also we know that in the current system, affordability of healthy diets is not possible. Uh, uh, and that's a big challenge and that requires thinking how we resolve that problem. So we are trying to reactivate an economy through the different, different types of programs that governments are trying to deploy. Uh, in a world which is still we are in COVID-19, we have not resolved the problem. COVID-19 is everywhere. In, in Europe, we are starting to go into the second wave in many countries. Uh, and in the US, it's never moved from the first wave. And in South America, never move out of the first wave. So how we handle that situation of that potential uncertainty that could force us to be not only in a lockdown because of decree, but a lockdown because of, of health issues, no? Like in my world of food, if, if I have a lockdown in the key ports in Brazil and in the key ports in Argentina of cereals, I have a problem of supply of food immediately because food won't be able to move. Even just looking at the mobility of vessels and the problems that we are facing today of changing crews of vessels could create a problem in terms of the trade of food. And that of course have significant consequences over poverty, could have consequences over potential uh, other types of issues in terms of, of, uh, of potential problems that we could be facing. So, so how we change this and, and what we can do and how much this could be an opportunity to change. The, the opportunities I have seen is that because of the tough situation in where we are, governments are looking at things a little bit different than before. Uh, you have a G20 that was able to get into an agreement very quickly on, on, on condemnation of the services of the debt, but it was not as strong as we would have liked, but at least they got into an agreement. Uh, so there is a window of opportunity of certain quote unquote type of cooperation, of course, with a lot of, with several outliers in that process. So that slight behavioral change could open opportunity to, to see what else we can do very fast. But within countries, governments are also starting to think differently because they have to figure out a solution to what they are doing. And this, they are taking this as an opportunity 
to change structural problems that they couldn't change before, like informality. Because if I have a window because of the transfer mechanisms I will have to put in place in a country that was really informal, that could be a mechanism through which I can formalize my economy and I can create a significant change. So, so that will require us to, to, to think differently how, how we can tackle those problems, no? Now, what we know also is that, uh, as it was mentioned before, uh, individuals and governments have different preference sets. Uh, and we also know, and, and experiments that I have been doing on behavioral economics before, is that uh, my behavior, my risk aversion, or my intertemporal location, my value of intertemporal location will vary if I am very poor, if I am not so poor, if I am rich. And the decisions I make are completely different. So my rationale is very different to what we normally assume in economics that is a, a fixed parameter and, and basically we are all rational individuals. My initial condition will change. So if I, I look at the risk aversion of a, a person that has very restricted access, is very unequal, very poor, his behavior, his risk aversion and his intertemporal discount rates will be completely different to a person that doesn't have those constraints. And we will think that they are making irrational decisions, but they are not necessarily making irrational decisions. Uh, and the only solution to that is basically to find a way to, to resolve this problem of, of inequality. It's not just moving people out of extreme poverty, it's moving them out of extreme poverty in a permanent way. And that requires moving, moving people not to 195 or whatever is the poverty, extreme poverty line, but to move them to $7 PPP a day per capita, which is a significant switch uh, to be able to, to achieve that. No? It's something extraordinarily different to, to what we have uh, today, today in mind. Now, in terms of my world of, of food, uh, what we know today is that if we invest around $14 billion per year for the next 10 years until 2030 of catalytic investments, not of transfers, so catalytic investments that will pay a return, assuming that governments will invest an equivalent level in their own countries, we can move around 500 million people out of undernourishment. But that brings a lot of challenges, how we invest that money so that we can make it efficient. So assume that we convince the world uh, to do that investment, which is nothing relative to the amount of trillions of dollars we're spending today in the recovery. Uh, what that will imply and how that could be done in catalytic investments. And one of the catalytic investments that we observe uh, that have played a or could play a significant role is infrastructure. So infrastructure could have a significant uh, return in terms of reducing inequality and in terms of helping to make more access to markets uh, to people. Uh, but that requires proper target. The problem we have in most of the investment that is being done right now, even by developing countries, including the US, for example, in the case of infrastructure, I was able to look at the whole mechanism in which the US, how they set up and how they prioritize infrastructure. And it's extremely outdated. It's like the technology they use to prioritize investment in infrastructure in the US is from the 50s or the 70s. They never progress about it. Chile has a, a lot more advanced mechanism to prioritize investment in infrastructure. Even Peru has a more advanced frame. The problem is that we don't have the money. But, 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 but again, if we look at, at, at the way it's being done, it requires a substantial change. Just take any investment plan in infrastructure in Africa. The only thing they are doing is they are upgrading whatever was there in the time of the mining industry. They forgot about everything else. They don't look at any link to agricultural areas or to areas where development can be through tourism and so on and so forth. They are basically upgrading infrastructure which was already there in the past and which today has very little relevance to what the continent is doing. The same in Latin America, the same in Asia. Okay, so that requires a completely different way of thinking. It requires, in my perception, is a thinking in terms of ISO profits over the space. So basically you can identify today where the potential revenues or profits can be of doing investments in infrastructure to, to be able to allocate. And China did that. So China spent a lot of time on figuring out where to deploy the railroads and the roads thinking on a mechanism of ISO profits over the space. Uh, I was part of it at some point, but, but it, that's how they thought about it. And that's how they were able to get so quick returns. Of course, they have a different governance mechanism. So infrastructure, innovation, technology could play a role, but we need to do a significant investment on how to handle that. And the problem there is that if we let those three accelerators of infrastructure, innovation, technology, and, and data to move alone, we will end in problems of concentration. 
we will end in problems of exclusion and we won't be able to reduce inequality. We will reduce, we will increase GDP growth as it was mentioned before, but it won't be able to create the inclusion you need to reduce inequalities. It will take too long. And we know that the results that we have seen in all the economies that have been growing in the last years, the inclusion and the reduction of inequality was completely lack with respect to the increase in GDP growth. And that is where the complements that are for me a necessary condition come. And those are the governance, human capital and institutions. So those are the three, which includes regulation, of course, as, as uh, Stiglitz, Joseph Stiglitz was saying, those are the three elements that if they are not there as a precondition, won't allow at all us to create this reduction in inequality. So my target, at least in what we do is I have to reduce inequality. If I don't reduce inequality, whatever I achieve in terms of poverty reduction will be depleted very soon with any choice. So if we don't have those complements in place, uh, it will create a significant problem to us. And building those complements is not easy, especially in human capital issues. So everybody talks about digital technologies. I will take one minute more. Uh, everybody talks about digital technologies, but digital technologies won't work if you don't have the capability in place. Okay, and those investments take time. So we need to have a strategy that will allow us to take that time of that those investments that are needed, but at the same time find a short-term solution to be able to reduce uh, those inequalities. So again, I, I think that more than thinking if, 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 if how the markets are operating, I think that we can find significant issues right now in the way we are operating, the way we are trying to resolve the problem of COVID-19 that we can take as an advantage to create this uh, structural change that, that could create an impact that we have not been able to do in the past. And we just keep repeating the same types of policies uh, that are just exacerbating even more the situation of inequality. Thank you.